I'm very proud to introduce Jennifer. Um, I always get Robert to look up some important information. So she, uh, her book, The Blackbird, was a New York Times bestseller. And she, uh, it was featured on the Oprah show. And, and, and Oprah even told the audience that this book should have been a book of the month, you know, that it was a must read. So I hope everybody will read it. And uh, before becoming a memoir writer, speaker, and a teacher, uh, she worked many years in television, um, you know, in, in the news for ABC affiliates from Montana to, to Oregon. And uh, she appeared on CNN. Her reports appeared on CNN, the ABC Nightly News, and she's been nominated for several Society of Journalism awards. So this was impressive, I thought. You know, it's just, <laughs> you, not only does she write books, she does wonderful special journalist things. Come on in. So anyway, um, I just, and also she spent 10 years in the teachings of Buddhism and she studied with the H.H. Dalai Lama. So you can tell them about that too. So everybody, welcome Jennifer. Hello. I was thinking to myself, we're an intimate group and I like that I sit and talk to 60 students a week. <laughs> I see a lot of people and I read their writing all the time and I'm talking all the time to large groups so it's nice to be intimate, to be small. We're going to have a little chat and I was very pedantic about uh, thinking about it, thought of ped pedagogy in my mind, thinking, oh, I would talk to you about uh, child narrators. Why do we choose child narrators? Why do some writers do that? All the way from Harper Lee who did To Kill a Mockingbird to Kate DiCamillo who has, uh, takes difficult subject matter and she wraps it into childlike tales. And a book I just finished the other day is called Peace Like a River by Leif Anger and it's also narrated by a very young child. Um, and so I've been thinking about that, coming to talk to you, that that would be what I would talk about because my first book, Blackbird, is in the voice of a little girl. First person, present tense is what we would call the point of view. But then I had a dream. I had a dream that I was here talking to you and I was gonna show you a video of what a bad driver I am. <laughs> and I was really excited about this idea in the dream. It's like I'm moving outside the boundaries of how I usually talk. So I'm gonna show up with this video and Scott's gonna roll it. He didn't actually have it, but this is in my mind. I just got this video and I'm gonna to explain to you why I'm such a bad driver and how I know I'm a really bad driver. In fact, I believe I shouldn't be on the road. I'm such a bad driver, which is, uh, confession. I mean, I think I'm a horrible driver. And <laughs> this whole conversation I had in my dream actually took my entire talk because I saw myself in front of you in this dream, wanting to do both things, talk about the child narrator, but also what a bad driver I am, and more about the film and why I had filmed myself as a bad driver. And so you're going to see where this takes us in a second, because this is all adding up to something. And when Psyche gives you that kind of a gift, you don't go, oh, whatever, crazy dream. <laughs> Psyche's trying to tell you something. I, I love dream therapy. I've been in it for four years. Actually, I've been doing dream work for 10 years, ever since I started meditating. Um, I study with an amazing Jungian uh, dream worker, and she's always teaching me the power of dreams, how they're bigger than we even can conceive. And we're living a dream right now. This is a top side dream. And then there's this unconscious dream that happens at night. And I was thinking, why a film? Why would I want to show them a film of what a bad driver I was? First off, to prove it's true, which is really interesting. That's a very interesting idea that in memoir, how can we prove it's true? How can I prove to you that this happened to me. And if you Googled a little bit further, you're very generous, but if you Googled a little bit further, you could find some people who have said what Jennifer wrote wasn't true at all. How can I prove them wrong? Because they say it's wrong, then that immediately raises in everybody's mind this question, well, what is true? What, what a memory can we rely on? And you as the reader, how can you lean into that? So that makes sense that I would want to prove to you that I'm a bad driver, not just say it, but have a film to verify it. Mm -hmm. But then also, what is the power of memoir? That's the crisis of memoir, like what's true about a memoir? What's true about my memory? What's true about your memory? What's true about the genre that everybody's exploring right now? But then on top of that, why would I wanna film it? And also, why would I wanna document it? 
And it really has very little to do with you as the reader or you as the viewer. Because isn't it true that when we document something to ourselves and we see ourselves in action, like I'll be watching this tape later and I'll see myself in action. I was speaking. This is what I did. This is how I gestured. And I'll grow and learn from watching that reflection of myself. I can't grow and learn right now because I don't see me, right? I'm just having the experience. I mean, I'm here and I, a part of me due to some intense meditation, not drug use, meditation, <laughs> is, can see me talking. There's a separate part of me that's watching Jennifer talk right now and she's like, really, did you want to say that? Well, that's what I'm saying, so just work with me. <laughs> but you really can't stop this moment and then get into the reflective capacity. It's happening, it's experience, but it's not something I can really take as information and I can work with, churn. And that's why we would film something, so you could work with it, you can churn it, you can contemplate it, and that's really what this is. This is a film from my memory of my experience, so I can work with this material. And in the end, someone had said something in my dream audience, something like, uh, was it cathartic? And I get this question often, was it cathartic to write about your life? Uh, did I feel cathected? Is that even a term? <laughs> it reminds me something of what you do to bulls. It's like, I don't think I feel that way. I think I feel in looking at my life, which I've done with four books, you know, I'm old, I'm 50, and people are like, what could you possibly write about? I have a lot of actually intense experiences I needed to look at, like see the film of, so I could know how I felt about those things. First, that they happened, which seemed a shock to me completely, and then what did they mean, and more, what did I make of them? What did I do with those experiences? So almost, it's, it's almost like my lived experience through documenting it in Blackbird, Stillwater, Show Me the Way, and then Found, which was a 20-year journey of self-exploration through writing memoir, gave me me kind of the essence that I would call Jennifer beyond just living and experiencing, living and experiencing, living and experiencing. So it's, uh, I think that that's probably what the dream was trying to say is that I'm gonna show you what a bad driver I am, but really I'm gonna see firsthand I am a really bad driver. And then through that, I can change. I can choose to change because I can see what makes me a bad driver. Right? It's usually very fast reaction. Some idiot cut me off, or I cut him off, and he's like doing his hand gestures, and then I'm like, well, uh, and right there, you're getting all that reaction. Nothing happens faster than road rage. Isn't it true? It's quite amazing. And so I get to see all that in seeing the film of it by replaying it, rethinking about it, contemplating it, and I actually have the opportunity to change and grow, which is the point, I think, of being human. I think the reason that we're here is to grow. That's the philosophers say. What is the point? What is the meaning? The meaning is to grow. The meaning is to think. The meaning is to reflect. We have this thing, reflexive, reflective consciousness. Uh, dogs don't sit around and go, you know, what does it mean, life? No, only cats do that. No, right? <laughs> they, you know, trees don't do that. Rocks don't do it. We do it. We have reflective consciousness. I'm in this room, I know I'm in this room, and I can watch myself in this room. And later I can replay what happened in this room, see it, and then change, grow. And so that's been the whole point of this whole journey, really, writing memoir. And that's where my dream ended. So that's my big message to you. Why would somebody do this? Why would somebody write about their life? Why would you write four books about your life? It's because I had a really big question. Um, it started when I was 30, consciously, I believe I was about 33, and I was with a guy and he wanted to have children. I, was, I got married. Everybody's doing it, I might as well. And so I got married and he said, well, let's have a family. And I was like, uh, I don't know if that's a good idea. I've done the marriage thing. We're married, we have the house. But he's not, people have children. I'm like, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think I would be a very good mother. It's one thing to be married and to be 
pretending to be like everybody else out there. But when you have a child, and it's going to be your job to care for that little creature for a long, as we were just talking, right? They don't leave until they're 30. I'm gonna be with these humans for a long time. And they're gonna be relying on me. And what we've learned recently through the beautiful writing of a wonderful woman named Meredith Hall. She wrote a book called Without a Map. If you've ever get a chance to see a beautiful memoir, this is a gorgeous memoir. And she talks about human chimerism, where through science they've discovered that every baby that you carry in your body, the fetal cells actually cross the protective barrier and enter the, woman, the mother's body and live, her, the child's cells live inside the mother's body and vice versa, the maternal cells cross the infant's protective barrier and live inside the body of the child. Wow, I mean, the ramifications of that thought process, that scientific study, is quite remarkable. And I think anyone who becomes a mother intuitively knows it's a tremendous burden and a tremendous responsibility, a tremendous joy in some ways, but also a tremendous responsibility. If you screw that up, it's a problem, right? Look at Hitler, they blame the mother. Look, he must have had terrible parenting. It still kind of goes on. What? Well, let's talk about the parenting. So the responsibility, the burden is great, even though some scientists will say, you know, that the seed will grow into what it's going to grow in and we really don't have very much influence on our children. I like to be hard on myself, and I like to hold myself to a ridiculously high standard. So I decided if I'm going to be a mother, I'm going to be an extraordinary mother. And that requires an extraordinary amount of consciousness. I can't just fake it anymore. And up to that point at age early 30s, I was faking it. I was a very unhappy person. And I didn't know why. Why would I be unhappy? I have everything. I'm well-educated. I'm attractive enough to be on TV news. I have everything available to me, enough food. I have shelter. I'm able to earn a living. What's the problem? It's not like living in India where women get set on fire when their husbands die. It's not like living in Afghanistan where they can't even show their faces. I'm lucky. I'm fortunate. So why am I unhappy? Well, that was a question I refused to even address until the idea that I would have to nurture and care and, and hold and be a mirror for a child, I was like, I have to answer that question. And then it went to, well, if I'm so unhappy and I'm confused if I could be a very good mother, then what is my significant model of mother? Who was my mother? And that became the question. Who was my mother? And my mother had died when I was seven years old. So then I decided to investigate why and how. Why did she die? How did she die? I was told she had cancer, but as an adult, realizing what cancer looked like, my mother didn't have any of those qualities. So that began this journey. And writing memoirs is a little bit like a Pandora's box. Once you open that baby, there's no closing it. And I don't really actually believe in hope. <laughs> I believe in faith, but hope seems a little iffy. Faith is another thing, so I'd like to change that item in the bottom of Pandora's box. And once it opened, there was no turning back. There really wasn't. Once you ask one question about the deep stuff inside yourself and you take on something like a memoir, um, it owns you until it's done with you. And that's what I found for 20 years, that it shook me good. And so when I started to write about my mother's life and death, um, and I wrote about her love, which I believe my mother loved me very much, but I knew her very, very short period of time. She died of a kind of complicated disease I didn't understand, looked like cancer, wasn't really a, a, a malignant kind of cancer. It was a benign form of cancer. And then right after her, within 18 months, my father died. And then for almost six or seven months, I was homeless on the streets of LA. I was living with a stepmother and her, and it was a typical kind of evil step family. And I was in the Church of Scientology, which in this book is called the Freedom Community Church because we didn't want the Scientologists to come after us. <laughs> that was all then, so we don't have to worry about it. And then my, um, and then my brother and I were split up. I had an older brother, we were split up, and he went to live with a family in Oklahoma, and I went to live with another family in uh, eastern, western Washington. I was adopted another time. This is a, 
more abuse was taking place. And eventually my brother ended his life by the time I was 19 years old. So that's a lot. It's a lot to think about. Like, okay, so what did all that mean to me? And how could I parent responsibly and not make all of that sorrow the reality of the child I was bringing into this world? How could I get to it? So I started with therapy. That was going to take about 80 years and be very expensive. So then I went right into writing because I love writing. I love investigating. And I, I took on this story that became Blackbird. And once I had written my very first draft of uh, uh, kind of a research, reporter research draft, I started studying creative writing at PSU under Diana Abu Jabber. And then I went over to Tom Spanbauer who writes uh, in Portland, Dangerous Writers. And he taught me to be a creative writer instead of a journalist. And I started to do this, this book, Blackbird. And I decided to do a first person narrator because it's first person present tense, which is really risky. If you're not familiar with point of view, that's the voice that's being told. And it's kind of the age of the, the person who's telling a story. Right now I'm writing a novel. It's set in 1911 Italy. The voice is an 85 year old narrator, but she's telling you about a time in her life when she was 16. So that's a first person past tense narration. And, but I, it's also very important she be 85 versus 16 because she brings a world of experience. And she's also lived in America since she was about 17. So she's Americanized, but she still has old world Italian in her. So that voice is really important. With Blackbird, I just didn't have any choice but to take this as a first person present tense narrator because she kind of came to me, that little Jennifer, little Jenny, I call her, she was talking. And once she saw I was gonna sit down and listen, she was like, okay, sit down, keep the M&Ms coming, and I've got something to tell you. And she really started to tell me this miraculous story that ended up becoming Blackbird. And it was, as it was happening, we were both experiencing it. And I never really thought, well, that can't be true. A couple of times I thought, well, that can't be right. And then I'd see a hypnoregression therapist, or I'd actually talk out, or I'd find some reports, uh, medical reports, and it was like, oh my God, that's totally true. Or I'd talk to an aunt and uncle, and they'd be like, that's very true, that totally happened. I was like, oh my gosh, she's got a really good, she's been over there like, waiting for me to pay attention to her. So how funny it is, but, the idea of bearing a child brought me into a relationship with a child, a child who had gone through this experience. So I'll read you just a couple pages of Blackbird just to hear that voice again. And I really did want to explore a little bit about why we pick children's voices. Why did I do this? Um, the only house I'll ever call home is the one on Mary Street. I actually can never read this book without getting weepy. <laughs> Whenever my daughter, my daughter's like, why don't you try Blackbird again, mommy? And I start to read it and I'm just like, <laughs> so she's very beloved to me. Uh, the only house I'll ever call home is the one on Mary Street. Mary Street is in Carson City, Nevada. And Carson City is flat valley to soft hills. Past the hills are the Sierra Nevada mountains. When you look up, the sky is deep blue, forever blue, and there are almost never any clouds up there. Clouds that do come gather on top of the Sierras and they look like wadded up tissue paper. Every now and then, a piece of cloud will tear away and float across the forever blue sky. There's one main street right down the middle of the city and it's called Carson Street. The state capitol building is on Carson and the dome of the capitol is painted silver since Nevada is a silver state. Over the dome, two flags kick the wind one blue for Nevada, one red, white, and blue for America. The Golden Nugget is on Carson Street too, but everyone just calls it the Nugget. From the Nugget, you go a couple of blocks and you can see the house where Auntie Carol and Uncle Bob live with a pack of my wild cousins. They're Stephen, Bobby Lou, Andy, Mark, Tracy, and Faith Ann. Auntie Carol is Daddy's oldest sister, and the only time I go to that house is for holidays or if Mama has to see a special doctor. West of Annie Carroll's house, you go Iris Street, Agnes Street, and then it's Mary Street, and our house is the one with the white fence and the big willow. When you come in the front door, there's always, there are three ways you can go. Straight ahead is the living room, right is the kitchen, left is a long hallway to bedrooms and bathrooms. 
The first bedroom is BJ's, and then it's the bathroom, and then it's my room. Mama and Daddy's room is at the end of the hall, and out their window you can see the big willow tree. If the sun is just right, the shadow of the tree comes into their room and lies right over the middle of the California king. Mama says the bed is called that because it's not as wide as a regular king, just a little longer, like the state. Next to the California King is a pair of silver crutches, the kind you ad adjust tall or short by pushing in a little silver bead. Mama can stand without the crutches and can even take a couple of steps. She still has to use the crutches when she walks to the bathroom and when she goes to any other part of our house. There was a time when Mama just walked like everyone else, when she was only in bed at night, when she drove her car and talked on the telephone and had lots of ladies over for card games and coffee and thick slices of banana nut bread. I remember when Mama was strong enough to lift me off my feet, toss me in the air, and catch me bent again. There's never been a time when I haven't been home with Mama. Daddy works, BJ goes to school, and it's just Mama and me all day, every day. In the morning, I sit outside her door and I listen. That's the rule. Moshi and Diana wait too. Moshi is one of those fast-moving crazy cats, and Diana is all <coughs> liquid in weight. I pet Diana's sa soft, sand-colored tummy and lay my head against the wall. Moshi is sitting apart from us, his brown head held high, blue eyes half closed. The rule is, no cats, no kids, not until the toilet flushes. So when the toilet finally flushes, Moshi runs to the door, Diana rolls away from my hand, and I get off the floor and walk to the kitchen. <laughs> Sweet. So then we get to know. I mean, we have a sick mother on our hands here, right? And Blackbird goes all the way through her death and then the death of my dad and ends when I go to stay with my grandparents. It's quite a story, quite a journey. It's the hero's journey. It's somebody who, no matter how many times you knock them down, they're going to get back up and drag their furniture through the city, whatever it takes. Uh, what was really interesting is, as I journeyed through the next three books of my life, I couldn't give it up. I couldn't stop writing about my life. And that's difficult in this society, because they're like, okay, stop, right? You're done. What are you, a narcissist? Kind of, probably, yeah. Their question hadn't really been answered. What, what happened with my mother? I did have a son. I got pregnant with my son on the anniversary of this mother's death. And I ended up giving birth to him. My water broke on Mother's Day on the three days before her birthday. Isn't that something? It broke on her birthday, actually, which was also Mother's Day that year. And then I had him a couple days later. And I was also the same age she was when, I died, when she died. So I was going to be her age. And that's when... I have my son. It was all happening there. That's when I knew I have to write Blackbird, something bigger than me. But I wasn't done. I was like, I couldn't stop. And after the Oprah thing and the traveling around the world thing, I think I was in 29 language, 29 countries and 22 languages. I traveled all around the world and, I, and then I was pregnant with my girl. And I wanted the world to leave me alone, but I couldn't leave the question alone. Like, there's so much more story. I need to keep looking at the film. I need to go back and look again. I need to keep looking back. There's something I've missed. And what was really interesting is that finally the world did leave me alone. Uh, my third book, my second book wasn't as successful. I think it was released on 9-11, um, right after, like within a month of 9-11. So that really took, it took, I was up here and then it went like here, which is kind of nice. Because after that, uh, I wrote my third book and I had my daughter and then my marriage fell apart, and then I totally disappeared into the mountains of uh, Colorado to study Buddhism, which was something I needed after all of this Blackbird, Stillwater, Show Me the Way. I've been on seven book tours. Is that right? Seven book tours by then. I'd been around the world. I'd had the two children. The marriage had gone the way marriages go when somebody doesn't like another person being such a popular girl. <laughs> and uh, I didn't mind the money, though. <laughs> The money was kind of fun, he said. So I gave him that, and I went off because Buddhists don't need money. I took the kids, and I went off to become a Buddhist because I really couldn't stop. I couldn't stop with the question, but I didn't know what else to do. I was, I was like, I've written three books about my life. I have countless essays. 
I'm looking and looking and looking, but I don't have an answer to a question. And ironically, when I arrived in Colorado studying Buddhism at a place called Tara Mandala, it's a 650-acre retreat center, it's beautiful, and up in the mountains, up the Four Corners, gorgeous place. And Tara is this beautiful deity. She's green, and she makes shit happen. Sorry, you can X that out. She makes things happen. Unlike a lot of the Christian deities, they kind of sit around quite a bit. You know, they're washing feet and things like that. But I really wanted somebody who could do something. And here's Tara. She can do stuff. She's compassionate, but she's active. She gets some things done. So I gave up my Christian tradition and became a Buddhist immediately because I love the female deities. Mostly I love Tara. And I ended up getting a tattoo here and my driver's license. My license plate was Tara. And I have a Tara tattoo. And it was Tara, Tara, Tara. And we were all doing Tara all the time, my kids included. And I was meditating like a lunatic and still trying to figure out what is wrong and why am I not as happy, I was happier, but why wasn't I not feeling that finished feeling? You know, I'm not finished watching the film. And in the midst of all this meditating, I was running out of money really quickly because Buddhism does not pay. There's no, med no meditating stipend that you get. And here we don't even get to go around with a bowl. It's just weird, right? So you can't do that. You can't hear my alms for the day. So I got a call from an organization that wanted me to come speak, and they were going to pay me quite a bit of money. And I was like, that's good. Money's good at this point. And they wanted me to talk about adoption. Were, they were the Virginia state organization that managed all adoptions, uh, foster care, and kinship. And they wanted me to come speak at their annual conference. Like about 500 people. It was a big deal. I'm like, what would I possibly say about adoption? Well, you were adopted. I'm like, I was a baby. <laughs> I had, you know, what? I don't know. But you've been adopted twice. Well, that's true. And so the money was just the thing. <laughs> I hate to admit it, but the money was the thing. Because I was running out and giving the X all a lot of it. And I really was working so hard on this question that I had neglected to actually imagine a career outside writing memoir. So I said, all right, fine. So I researched the heck out of adoption. And so I couldn't just talk about something I don't know about, really. And I met all these incredible people. And one of them happened to be a woman named Nancy Verrier, who wrote a book called uh, The Primal Wound. And she was an adoptive mother who noticed uh, a difference between how she felt towards her adoptive child and how she felt towards her natural child. And it's a very brave book because she noticed there's a fundamental difference in the ways the babies were reacting to her. She loved them, but there is a fundamental natural difference that she noted, and she wrote about it. It made her very controversial. But I really wanted to hear about this, and she also said, I've read your books, honey, and this whole being off in the mountains wanting to be enlightened, that's what an adoptee does, and why? because they're mourning for their mother. And what you've been doing is looking for mother. And I was like, yeah, I don't see that. <laughs> she said, I'm begging you, of all the people I've ever talked to, go find your mother. And she said, that deep unhappiness that was living inside me comes from this lack of connection to that original relationship and that desire to find mother would actually bring a kind of bonding and uh, relationship at the human level that I had not yet experienced. I had that polarity with my children. They had bonded with me, and I knew that we were attached and bonded, but I had never bonded with anyone. And I didn't kind of believe that. I thought I had bonded with this mother. She said, you attached, but read your own prose, and you'll see that you actually had, were always pushing her away. And I was like interesting. I think you're wrong, is what I said. That's usually how I approach most things I do in life. I'm going to prove you wrong, right? I think you're wrong. She said, I guarantee you, you meet this woman who is your mother, within five minutes of being with her, you will begin to bond. And you don't even have to like her, because I was thinking all of these things. I was throwing up every possible reason not to meet my real mother. Uh, what if I don't like her? What if she doesn't like me? What if she doesn't care? What if I don't care? What if she's an idiot? What if I'm an idiot? <laughs> So many, I wanted, and she, that's exactly what a person would do who's terrified. I was terrified to find her and be rejected again. Who knew, right? Who knew? So I found her. It took me three months. I hired a private investigator. I found her. 
She lived right next to where I was born, the hospital where I was born. She's always been there. She married my dad. She, I have a full brother. I have a sister. I have a huge family. And she was never going to look for me because it was such a source of shame. So we got together. And my fourth book is actually about our reunion. And we got together, and it was very emotional, as you can imagine. Um, she's amazing and beautiful. And if you want, I'll read you a passage about finding her, and maybe you'll hand me that book if you wouldn't mind. Would you hand me found? Yeah. yeah. Um, she's amazing. She's beautiful. She's funny. She's smart. Uh, she's she's got incredible breasts. And I was like, well, I didn't. I, why didn't I get those? And she goes, Oh, my second husband bought me these. So I was like, She's kind of a showgirl. And I'm like, oh my God, you're just, because my mother, Janet, from, show, from Blackbird, was a very small, very quiet, dark woman. Um, very small and a very quiet. And my whole Lauk family, very small, very quiet. We just don't make a lot of noise. We're like this, leave us alone. But my family is like show people. They're like show girls. <laughs> They're big and loud and everybody's talking all the time. They got these huge gestures. I was like, God, you people are all so huge. Mm -hmm. You're all so out there and loud and cool. <laughs> wow, I could do that too. So here's the day that we met. She came, I, I found her, and I flew her into Portland so she and I could hang out. And this was after having spoken, and the event at the, the speaking conference was amazing. But really speaking at that adoption conference wasn't about speaking at all about that at that conference. It was, in a weird way, the divine spirit, psyche, saying, really what you're looking for is this. This is why you're unhappy. So in Found, I wrote, Catherine's on the earliest flight from Reno. She will land in Portland by 8 AM. I am going to pick her up at the airport. We get a day together just this day because she has a sick cat, a job that needs her, and appointments in her date book she cannot possibly reschedule. reschedule. I stand in my closet and evaluate my wardrobe, jeans, tops, sweaters, skirts, what to wear, what to wear. Should I choose a fancy combination that makes me look pretty or perhaps something professional that makes me appear credible? Perhaps I can pick an ensemble that says, love me, take me home with you, don't leave me again. Catherine and I have talked several times on the phone. We've exchanged emails with photos from her life, Christmas, holidays, anniversaries, birthdays, graduations, and in her pictures I have seen aunts, uncles, grandmothers, a brother and a sister. They are my people. They all have the shape of my smile, the curve of my eyes, the size of my chin, the span of my forehead. And as I look at the life my mother has gone on to have without me, I tell myself this story. She's had a decent life with family who's loved her. That's good. I'm really happy for her. Deep down, though, push low and flat, another story. I finally feel what she felt I would feel. She, she did say, I'm so worried you're angry at me. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not mad. I'm not bad. I feel a seething rage that turns the contents of my stomach to toxic waste. She made a life without me. She made a life as if I did not exist. She kept me a secret for 44 years. She told me she would never search. She would have never searched, not ever. And to cope with the pain I have been feeling for most of my life and didn't know, I have been denying and redirecting. Now I drink way too much wine late at night, or I get out my bike and pedal hard and sweat myself blind as if training for the Iron Man, or I press my Spencer and my Joe to my sides and read silly books like Captain Underpants and Bad Kitty. The latter is the only way to actually st still my fury, their warm bodies and their sweet breath and their steady hearts and that familiar sound of their laughter. My children are whole and loved and kept children. And their proximity makes me whole and loved and kept, too, for a while. Beige cords and a black cardigan. I pull myself together in these clothes because they're every day, comfortable. I'm dressed and ready and make a top-down survey in the mirror. I don't need to impress her. Meeting her is not going to be a contest or a job interview. In the main terminal of the Portland International Airport, I'm surrounded by a stream of travelers arriving and departing. 
I hold a bunch of roses that were cut from my backyard. They are the best of the year, buds the size of extra large eggs. And I've added in sprigs of rosemary and lavender. The arrangement is wrapped in a white silk scarf that was actually given to me after a teaching with the Dalai Lama. This is a perfect demonstration of the kaleidoscope of conflicting emotions. I really hate this mother who gave me away. And I love her enough to bring the very best from my garden and my practice. And this hate and love is working inside my skin like a tug of war. It's a miracle I am functioning at all. At the inbound waiting area, I sit. I check the time on my cell phone. Then I check the time on my watch. There's a five minute difference between them and I readjust my watch. Inbound travelers fill the corridor, people with busy expressions in striding quickly, a businesswoman who pulls a wheelie bag and talks on the phone, another woman with a baby in a stroller. Here comes a teenager listening to his iPod, jeans around his hips. I shift to the edge of my seat. Did she change her mind? Was her flight delayed? I check my phone. No message. A tall woman in high heels walks my way. She's wavy in my field of vision like a mirage. I stand up. She's wearing open-toed, strappy heels and slim-fitting jeans. She has narrow hips, a lean body, and wide shoulders. She rolls back with the stance of a trained dancer. She has high, round cheekbones, and her hair is this lovely shade of auburn, like yours. Jennifer, she asks. I nod. I think I'm nodding. We embrace then, and it's not like a hug. It's more like this magnetic slap against her body, and on pure instinct, my arms go around her back, my chin digs into her collarbone, and I inhale the smell of her almond perfume. A flood of relief moves through me. This is my mother. She's the one. Catherine is more restrained. Her side of the embrace is brief and stiff, and I've heard it's that way when the mother has been found. They feel exposed and even embarrassed. She's lived all of my life, and most of hers, in secrecy, and in shame. She's the first to break away. And while I make a mental note to give her room, an arm's length is really all I'm going to allow. I keep my hand on her shoulder (laughs) and feel the shape of her bones and even the texture of her muscles and the skin through the fabric of her silky brows. My mother is utterly familiar to me like a dream I've been having all my life. I regress as if I'm one of my own children when they're in proximity to my body and assume ownership of this stranger, my mother. My God, you're amazing, I hear myself say. Look at you. I take her in from the top of her short auburn curls down to her toes painted a shining fire engine red. I touch her arms to her elbows and wind my fingers into hers. Do you play music? No, no, she says. I touch her hips, I turn her one way, right, then left, then right again. I go around her full circle. Like, look at your fucking legs, I say, they're incredibly long. And then she laughs out loud, how can she not? Look at your fucking legs, she says. And she does this flashy gesture, opening her hand like a game show hostess at my legs. I look at my own hands, which are just like hers, and I see them in a new way. I have my mother's hands. How tall are you, she says. Five nine. How, I'm five ten, she says. She holds out her foot. What size are your feet? I'm a nine, I say, kicking my foot out of my sandal. She goes, me too. We laugh as if the shoe size is simply hilarious. I take Catherine to breakfast, a pancake and coffee place called Zell's. We order the same thing, eggs on toast. While we eat, we talk fast. My words spill over hers and her words spill over mine. We're the same way. We're talkers and we're fast talkers. We drink cup after cup of coffee, reaching for the cream at the exact same time and then crack up when our hands collide. And we use our hands when we talk. We make these windmill-sized gestures to get our points across. Our voices rise and then fall in the same vocal range. We are so alike. After a while, I cannot track the similarities. So after we get done having breakfast, I take her, my mom, to a house that's empty where she and I can just hang out and visit for a day. And I um, make her tea and we have some chocolate. And it's very emotional, as you can imagine. Like, I love her. I hate her. I want her. I want her to go as far away as possible. I have a seething headache and I'm bonding with her. Her skin feels amazing. I've never felt skin like that other than my daughter's and my son's. Like, she smells perfect. She's exactly right. I'm bonding, and I can hear Nancy in my head like, I told you. I guess I'm sending you 50 bucks because you're right. I was bonding with this woman, and as it all started to come to an end, 
And another thing, another amazing coincidence was I wear almond perfume. That's my signature scent. Um, my, I named my daughter Catherine with the same spelling as my mother. I never knew my mother's name. And then as we were wrapping up our conversation, she goes, you know, I just can't get used to calling you Jennifer. When I was carrying you, I, was, I named you. And I, was like, I already had a name for you. And I said, really? Tell me. And she said, oh, it's silly. You're going to think it's stupid. And I said, no, no, I want to know. And she goes, well, I loved Gone with the Wind. I was reading that book endlessly because they sequestered her for the several months of her pregnancy. They tried to send her to a girl's home in San Francisco, but because that was so scary for her, she begged to stay home, but she would hide in the bedroom and nobody would see her for months. Nobody talked to her except a tutor. Her whole family just totally shunned her in essence. Um, and so she read endlessly and she was reading Gone with the Wind and she, and I said, oh God, please don't say you named me Scarlet. Please, please God, please God. And she said, no, I named you Tara. I know. And then I knew why I'd become a Buddhist and why I fell in love with Tara. I mean, I fell crazy in love with Tara, not just cuckoo. I mean, tattoos, license, you remember. I was like, I started to cry because all of a sudden I realized I haven't just been asking the question, what happened to my mother since I started writing Blackbird? I've been asking the question, what happened to my mother since my mother and I were separated on the day I was born? I've been looking for her. You know, they say you can put an infant down at the bottom of the mother's foot, a brand new baby, and that baby will make its way to the breast. I just happened to have clawed a much longer distance and it took me a little longer. But I've never been quite as victorious, like Joan of Arc, sitting next to my mother after I found her. And then I wrote Found, and I was done writing about my life. And I had come to peace. I, have, I had looked back enough. <laughs> I had looked at the film enough to answer the really deep question and to do what my soul was here to do. And that was to grow through this really profound experience of mother loss and answer the questions of how to be a, a really good mother, be present even while I'm suffering from mother loss. Interestingly, it's taken me 20 years to make this journey. My boy is eight, 17 now, my daughter's 12. I've agreed completely to pay for any therapy necessary. I've said, you know, they know every step of the way. They know that I'm working, I'm struggling, I'm a work in progress and I'm not the best mother. Um, but I am their mother, and I kept them, and they know the truth, and I know the truth, and it's been, you know, it's been a worthy journey. I'm really, really glad I did it, and I'm also really glad that uh, that I used that little girl narrator. That was a really daring and risky thing to do. It was very unusual. People come to me and they say, Jennifer, would you uh, would you write Blackbird in a different point of view now that you know that that was so controversial? And I I don't think I would but I would hardly ever encourage a writer to do that first person present tense narration unless you just have one killer voice like we see in To Kill a Mockingbird. That's a killer voice. Scout is just among one of our favorite. Yeah. So, you know, that's where my dream started, stopped and that's kind of where I'm stopping. Um, that's a big story. So I'll stop and maybe ask, ask you guys to ask some questions. And then we can talk a little bit more about child narrators if you want. But I feel like I might need to stop just for a second we chat. Do you have any questions at all? Yeah. Um, did you continue with the child narrator in the episodes? No. Then I moved into first person past tense. Yeah. I think I did first person present through still waters. And then I would do past tense for flashbacks, things that would put it in perspective. Um, I incorporated more. I was also, interestingly, uh, as I was creating my books, I was also learning how to be a creative writer. It's not like I had many, many years. I had been a journalist, but not a creative writer. So I was practicing with all these different techniques. And um, it's really hard to write. If anyone tells you, I, I love people who come up to me, like, yeah, you know, I'm retiring. And I'm thinking it's on my bucket list. I'm going to write that novel. I'm like, I know, I want to do surgery when I have time. Let me go get this scalpel and just cut into someone. It's how hard. Google it. Watch some YouTube videos. Writing is so hard. And to do it well. You know, I, I never say this, but right now I've actually, I've left, 
I've left creative nonfiction. I don't write about my own life anymore. I stopped about three years ago because I'm really quite sick of me. Um, <laughs> I am quite sick of Jennifer. And the story's told. I know what I was looking for. I needed the answer. I found the answer. I don't feel compelled. I will probably go back to that form later because I've just cultivated it. But I've been training myself to be a novelist now, and I'm working on my first novel. And it's really beautiful. Um, but I've had another really steep learning curve. I've had to learn how to be a novelist take on fiction, do it in a well that's really entertaining and really compelling and with a subject I care about. Um, and I just, now I just want to tell everyone, respect the book. Respect a good book. When you read a good book, think for a moment, just take a second and go, they spent years, like I've spent three years on this book alone. And 10 years I've sat with this voice of the main narrator in my book, 10 years, like, Remember, remember how hard it was. Give a moment. Oh. <laughs> so hard. And I don't like to say that because I used to think, oh, yeah, you just burn them out. Because Blackbird did come out really quick and Still Waters did come out really quick and Found came out and Still Waters Show Me the Way. All four of my books were like, bing, 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 bing. And I really didn't respect how freaking hard this is. It's an incredible art form. How long did it take you to write Blackbird? And what would you say the major differences that you're learning about becoming a novelist? Um, pacing is one of the things, like to the difference between being a novelist and a memoirist is, especially memoir, if you really think about what it is, when Ordinary People came out as a movie in 1985, I believe, that was really what we call the kickoff in the business of writing creative nonfiction. It was a kickoff for a memoir in its current incarnation. We did have the great writers, the Fitzgeralds and the Salingers writing about their lived experience, but they didn't call it a memoir, it's an autobiography, or they would maybe memoirs. But it wasn't this common thing that we see now, the everyday man writing the, the life of an average person. Even in the New York Times, it wasn't that long ago, they were like, please stop everyday man, stop writing your everyday story, we don't care. It's interesting, right? Yet memoir is selling outrageously successfully. It's like the sales went up like 400% between two th 2003 and 2006. It was crazy how successful Frank McCourt came out and Mary Carr. Um, and so when the genre came out, there was pretty much like this free-for-all. We didn't know what this is. What is memoir? You're taking your memory, but you're making it creative. It may not be true. It's you taking liberties with the memory. So you could be kind of sloppy with writing a memoir. And you didn't have to hold yourself as diligently as to what you have to do as a novelist. Novels require a kind of pacing, and the reader knows when that pacing's awry. When it's a real life story, we'll indulge some sloppy pacing. We'll just, we're just more willing to because, well, a little girl's pulling her furniture, her mom died, and well, I just want to see what happens, right? So we're more interested from a voyeuristic perspective. But as a novel goes, and as a story, like the plots based storytelling that we've had forever, really, um, information comes into a reader and into the psyche, your psyche, in percentages, parcels, and you're expecting things at certain times. And if it's not happening, you'll put that book down. It's not a good book. And so to understand pacing and what needs to happen in that novel, that is a whole nother mindset. I really had to learn. I teach it at the Attic Institute where I teach, but I tried to study it in college and I, no one would teach me how to be a novelist. They would just say stupid things like, oh, I'll change your plot and maybe kill a bunch of these characters and good writing and keep going. But they never taught me about structure, really what is plot, didn't teach me about characterization, didn't teach me about you know this pacing thing I'm talking about. Books, uh, novels need to have a positive and a negative charge all the way throughout the story so our hero has gains and losses, gains and losses, gains and losses. You can see this in movies. It gives you of the feeling like you can stay with someone. If they're only having loss after loss after loss, it starts to become quite soul debilitating. 
That's life, actually. <laughs> you know, that's memoir, that's Blackbird. Loss after loss after loss. But little victories are what novels bring to us. And those victories help pull us along while our narrator or our hero goes through the transformation that makes him different at the end than he was at the beginning and gives him the tool to be heroic, like our Odysseus can now, you know, slay the suitors because he's gotten through all these challenges and tests and he's learned all these amazing lessons. And I just didn't know that. And Blackbird, if I, looking back from a fictional perspective, having looked at how I wrote this book, I would write this book completely different. Mm -hmm. I would have moved my first, what we call plot point, I'd have moved my first plot point back. Um, your first plot point should be 25% within a story. Mine's almost halfway. <laughs> That's a slow pl first plot point. That's when the story really changes and the, your hero has to make a decision. So... You know, it's sloppy. Blackbird's sloppy. <laughs> it follows the structure form, but it's not as beautiful and as a novel. It's not clean, I guess. Uh, so that's that was interesting. I've learned that. And I also learned this positive and negative charge. I've also learned about theme, and you really have to understand your theme. It's called the controlling idea. What's your controlling idea? What's running the story? If any of you watch movies on a regular basis, you pretty much know what that movie's about. Cider House Rules is a movie that's about the complexity about, of abortion. Abortion's complicated, that's kind of the controlling idea. American Hustle just came out. I don't know if you're f familiar with that movie. It's a great movie about the 70s. Everybody wants to believe something is the controlling idea there. And that makes you willing to be conned. You're, you're able to be conned because you want to believe something. So that's what we would call the theme or the controlling idea. And all books have a controlling idea. Who knew, right? Yeah. So I've been teaching myself this for the last three years and also writing my novel, and I'm in my 10th draft. Um, and I submitted it in the spring to uh, about 125 agents because I want a brand new agent, a brand new start for my career. And I secured a wonderful, wonderful agent. She was delightful. Many op I had lots of options because of my experience, but I really wanted to build a new career. And she also said, your book is an entry-level novel but you're not an entry level writer. <laughs> so you're going to have to bring the not you're going to have to bring it up a bar or two, which is hard because it's hard to write a novel and mine's is entry level and that's good, but I can't write an entry level. I have to write killer. So I'm actually working with a killer editor and she's helping me kind of she's she writes things that I'm like not in 30 years would I have ever come up with this. Never, never in a million years. Thank thank you editor. And it's me <laughs> really respect the power of the editor because I've never been edited in any of my career. I've never had a collaborative relationship. People have been more like, oh my God, yes, we'll publish it. Uh, <laughs> which is so funny that you never, I've never been edited. But now I get to have, enjoy that relationship. And I think a good editor can make such a difference in your work. And she's making a huge difference in my novel. So for your novel, it, is it a particular genre? Um, kind of historical fiction. I want to call it historical fiction and maybe a little magical realism. I'm just, after having spent all that time in Buddhism and met all these incredibly cool female deities that do great stuff, um, I wanted to kind of take on Catholicism, actually. I think I have a nut against Catholicism due to the, my adoption. Um, the Catholic charities facilitated that. My mother wasn't Catholic. Um, and they actually knew both my parents died and they never let... My, my family know that I was on the street. I had nobody, and they never let my birth family know. Catholic Charities is kind of weird about that. I guess I sink or swim. So I, I swam. <laughs> so I think I have a nut against the Catholics. So in my book, I'm taking on traditional Catholicism in Italian culture, where the, the priests are literally like gods. They get away with anything. They're the magicians, and the people are terrified of them at some level, and they control every aspect. They get into the homes, and they tell the women when to sleep with their husbands or to sleep with them. Uh, you know, They tell people how to run their businesses, and the church owned great deals of land, so they took a lot of rents. So I'm trying to get into that world where the Catholic Church was horribly infused in this culture, and then have my young hero in... In, uh, wind her way into a subculture of empowered women that came pre-patriarchy. So an entire tradition of women who work within the confines of patriarchy, but they're from that matriarchal time and tradition, and that they actually affect change, but undercover. 
And she enters that group to get some information to take a priest down who's doing nasty things with the girls in the village. So <laughs> it's a little adventure swashbuckling thing. <laughs> it's very cool. Yeah, and I've traveled to Italy. I have a, um, a relationship with a woman who is 100 years old. So she tells me all about the village at the time. And her, aunt, her, her niece translates for us, and we have conversations. And her niece has taken me all through the village where I set my, my thing. I've gone and met with all the villagers. I'm like, it's okay. I'm writing a story about a gnarly, nasty priest. <laughs> They're like, are you kidding? The stories we could tell you about the priests. And they did. And I started writing. And they were like, well, thank you. We want you just you know, to write a great, beautiful story. Go, oh, we love you. More wine. <laughs> it was really fun. Uh, you were going to ask me a question. Well, I was just going to comment that you're pretty ballsy for you know taking on the narration of an 85-year-old Italian, but you're not. You're not 85. I know. You know, and I was thinking, wow, that's pretty possible. But now I see you have, you know, great, a hundred-year-old woman. You know, yeah, yeah. Help you and the interpreter, and you're there in the culture and. Yeah. yeah that's well, yeah, and when you're crazy, when you're a crazy person, and I'm definitely would definitely that's why I'm a bad driver. A crazy person shouldn't be driving. I'm a crazy person. I think people who've had a tremendous amount of trauma have access to certain ways of thinking that are way outside the normal way of thinking, which is we're crazy. And I like the crazy. I love the crazy. But this story actually kind of fell into me after I had parted with my husband and started studying Buddhism. And I actually kind of had this story just drop into me about I wanted to contemporize the life of the Virgin Mary and make her one of us now. Because I just really have a hard time believing that I would be a 16-year-old girl impregnated by God and I wouldn't have something to say about that, right? I just, I'm having some trouble with that. And then she would marry a 40-year-old widower. She wouldn't have anything to say about that. I just thought, you know, I'd like to see what Mary has to say. What would Mary do? So I had to make a world for Mary. And I had her grandparents come from along the 45th parallel, which would be Jewel, Oregon. If you're familiar with driving out to the Oregon coast, there's Jewel, Oregon. I had Jewel, which is a nothing of nothingness. I went out there and I looked at it and I said, okay, I would have her great grandmother or her grandmother be Jewel, who what is Joya in Italian. And they named Jewel after Joya. Okay, so her and her husband, Costanzo, came in 1912, right before the First World War, and they brought Nocciola, which is a filbert, because we grow filberts on the 45th parallel here, and they grow them on the 45th parallel there too, in Italy. So then I went like this, and I picked a village in Italy, and so this story kind of fell into me, and she was the grandmother for Mary, and I had written that entire book. And it was like this monster of a story. And that voice was always in my head, Jewel. She was always, she was such a powerful character. I could never get away from Jewel. And she just was always dominating the story. And when I couldn't actually figure out how to write a novel and I studied in college, people all said, we love Jewel. We just love Joya. So kill everybody else and make it about Joya. And I was like, well, I kind of don't want to do that. But why don't I do her origin story? And so, interestingly, I started to write it, but I wrote it from a 16-year-old's perspective, and that's where I got so stuck. Mm -hmm. And recently, thank God, Jewel's voice came back to me as an 85-year-old woman, and she just started to talk. It was like at 2 in the morning, and she started to talk and narrate. And she was saying this beautiful line, like, if only I could speak it in Italian. The language is like love. It's so soft and so beautiful. This story would be so much better in Italian. But... I don't have the dialect anymore. I've been in America too long, so, you know, I have to do it in the English. And I was like, oh my God, that's really good. And I started writing. I was like, cool. And my book just has taken off then from that point. And it is ballsy because I am holding Troya as an 85-year-old woman telling a story about a 16-year-old girl. And uh, it's crazy. It's crazy, <laughs> right? But I get paid. I get to do it. You know, maybe it'll sell. Maybe I'll come back and we'll talk about Joya, how fun that's been. Yeah, yeah, it's a crazy, crazy thing to be a writer. I love it. Was there another question I saw a hand? Hmm. Any other questions at all? Yeah. Do you still have a relationship with your mother? I don't. I don't, unfortunately. Was it too hard? It was too painful for her. 
It was too, too painful for her. Um, her pain made it painful for me. <laughs> I would say that I was really eager to be with her. And so, um, we spent a lot of time together. I think we spent probably 18 months together. She had never told anyone, not her own children, none of her friends. I outed her. And I think she was really furious about that. Um, and she was also still 17. And her experience was not unusual. There's a wonderful book. It's called The Girls Who Went Away. And it was uh, by a wonderful writer. I can't remember her name right this moment. But she did an investigation of the 2.5 million American girls in that era who were forced to give up their children. It was illegal. You didn't. You have a baby. You don't have the right to take the baby from the woman. Um, but they were told it was illegal to keep them. And my mother was one of them. She's 17. You're not legally of age. You can't keep this child. And they also did just horrific things to them. And she, my mom was actually um, strapped down. Um, and she, while she labored, and then she was forced, the baby was forced out of her. She, did, she said, I don't even remember being in labor. So the trauma for her, she was really locked in 17-year-old, she's a 17-year-old, 65-year-old. Mm -hmm. And to be around a 17-year-old, 65-year-old is challenging. My 17-year-old's more mature in some ways than her. And yet she's also, she's so fragile. And she's so uh, kind of confused. And so whenever I'm there, that brings that all up. And I look a lot like my dad. So that brings that out for her too. She and my father split after my brother was about two years old. And that was really painful for her because it's very expensive to travel all the time. But I wanted to see her at least once a month. And I think that was wearing for her, that I would be living there and she would be seeing, I would be seeing her all the time. But one of the things, one of the most beautiful gifts that she gave me, and everything she gave me, that my life my life, that I've had a life, she didn't abort me, is an amazing gift. And I'm so incredibly grateful for my life. Um, but she also gave me an incredible gift in that I asked her if she would do some bonding exercises. Um, you find them in couples therapy, especially the work of Harville Hendricks, where you, um, attachment work, apparently one of the biggest issues in marriages, why they fall apart is that we don't attach well to one another in our independent culture. And so Harville Hendricks teaches us these holding exercises that are non-sexual. We hold each other. And it just relax into one another, really be held and hold. And so I asked my mom if she would do that. If she would just hold me and I could listen to her heart. And it seemed like weird. And she's like a Republican. She loves Sarah Palin. She, you know, she's a really intense, born again Christian. And I was like, I am just sure she is gonna be throwing my ass out. And she said, no, I can do that. And she was super nervous. Well, sure, well, I can do that. Well, I, can do that. Well, I don't see why not. What, what, of course, you're my child. We should totally do that. <laughs> I said it would actually help me. My therapist had said it, it's going to be really good for your brain if you can just have her hold you. So she did that like four different times. And she wouldn't let me go, which was really sweet. She was like, you're much smaller than I thought. <laughs> you look very big, but you're quite small. You know, you're very fine. And she would start doing what moms do. You know, kind of like touching the nose. And it was so cute. <laughs> and I'm like, Mom, I'm good now. I can get up. And she's like, no, no, no I'm, I'm totally comfortable. <laughs> like, I'm actually good. And those four times of being held by her changed my chemistry and have changed my way of being in the world, really. I've bonded with her. My brain changed completely. Every time I got up, I was like, dude, I feel stupid. Stoned. <laughs> she was, my brain was really different in my head. And she was all just nervous. She cuts pizza with scissors and she would make a pizza and cut it really fast and eat it. Because she was just nervous, I think, that she was feeling things too. But what she was feeling, I don't know. I think just confused. Um, so we did our best. And she gave me the bonding. And, you know, I'm much happier. And she read this book. And she was very generous. I, she didn't have to allow herself to be in this book. I did change names, and I changed my brothers' and sisters' names. The brothers' and sisters also had a really hard time with it. My brother was furious with her, and they actually had a massive falling out because he, she lied to him, and he couldn't really forgive her. And so, you know, when a whole family falls apart like that, it's better to exit stage right. And so I did. It's all good. I'm fine. I have my kids. One day, I think, you know, we'll probably, she'll get a little older. 65 is young. Mm -hmm. Still ripening. <laughs> uh, yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned another author in the in book. 
Was it the one who wrote about adopting children, or was it another one? Was it Millard or? I read, I've mentioned a lot of books. So I talked about Nancy Verrier. She wrote a book called Primal Wound. I mentioned Meredith Hall. She wrote a book called Without a Map. She's an adoptive mother. And she wrote, this actually became a template for my book Found. Uh, I loved her writing so much. It had me staring at the wall at three in the morning. Um, she's so good. And she was forced, uh, she had a baby in New England and she was forced to give up her son. And she ended up uh, doing the human chimerism studies as part of her work because she slowly started dying, actually, like physically dying. And she couldn't understand what was happening to her, the pain in her body after she gave up her boy. And over the first probably eight or nine years of his life, she totally went way downhill and ended up in Afghanistan as a Bedouin, kind of just, kind of just wandering in this really bizarre state. And it turned out her, her boy was being horribly abused, physically abused, and she was feeling it. She, that's when she was bringing up the ramifications of human chimerism, chimerism, that our cells are in each other's bodies so she could feel it. And my mom and I talked about that, and she actually said, you know, there were many times, many times in your life that I would go to my mother and I would say, we should go find Tara. I have a feeling something's really bad with Tara. And of course, things were really bad for me, weren't they? And my grandmother would say, you know, leave it alone. She's, she has her own life. You only mess things up. So it's quite interesting, those feelings people have. Yeah. How do you decide the classic problem of when you're done with a book? How are you going to decide with the novel you're writing? Mm, when the priest gets dragged to the forest and killed, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you figure out when you're done, when you see the crisis. When you see your hero, or if it's a tragic situation, uh, the reversal where the antagonist has become so powerful or has learned everything that they can that they're going to take the, the tragic hero out. Uh, the crisis for the hero in the, in the hero's journey, which all books are actually the hero's journey at some level, um, when your character reaches the crisis point when they have to change in order to facilitate the heroic outcome, the crisis. We usually see this when we read books or watch movies, right, as all is lost, the lull. We call it the all is lost lull. That's the crisis, the critical crisis. When, the, when you ask, and the, and the narrator himself asks, do I have what it takes to do this job? And so you know at that point you're in the presence of your ending because that crisis creates this kind of wall of fire that your hero has to walk through. And once they've walked through it, they can never be the person they were when the book started or even at the point that the journey really began. And that crisis means it's now start to slay, time to slay your antagonist. It's time to wrap this up and tell us how everybody's faring and be done. You don't want to drag it out too much. So it's right around the crisis. Fascinating. Isn't it fascinating? You go and watch movies now, you'll never think of them in the same way, right? It's like, when does it end? It ends when your character is irrevocably changed and they can be heroic, truly heroic under their own steam. Um, and so my little Joya will be heroic and she'll save the day and free the girls. And, <laughs> and it probably will be another book because I, it's a kind of her coming to America and having Mary as her granddaughter. Uh, I don't know if I'll do that or not. I'm getting pretty tired of Italy. I want to, I have this other book I'm thinking about, which is about sleep, sleep deprivation. And I'm really <laughs> interested in all the afflictions due to sleep deprivation. And I, people who don't need it, people who do need it, people from, who die from sleep deprivation. So I want to write that contemporary kind of real relationship novel. So it's kind of fun. Yeah. I cannot tell you how happy I am to have talked to you. Thank you for listening to me. It's been lovely. Thank you. And if you buy a book, I'll sign it for you back there.